Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So thanks uh, very much for your interest to the AID workshop and uh, welcome you back. Okay. We will go on to have the AID workshop. Okay. So here are some of this, the information. So the Monday is the uh, video. Monday's workshop video is available, has been posted to the YouTube. So you can uh, access to the video through the following link. Okay. And then I have a brief review of the pack group. Okay, and thanks for the mirrors work. And also this uh, summarizes the possible questions and to uh, set up the possible the hackathon groups. So here are this a brief review. So the group one is for the improved toolings. Uh, second group is respond for the diversity, inclusivity, and the general participants characteristics. So the Stephen take the group coordinator. And uh, Group three is responsible for the affiliation and the industry control. And this is a big group, and there are many uh, members here. Okay, so I also the group four and the group five are merged. So there's the, they are focused on the IETF process, about this, the decision process, and also about this, the content analysis of IETF documents. And uh, Michael respond for the coordinator. Okay, we also have this, the group six about the sustainability and the climate change. So the sub respond for the coordinator. And also we have the group seven. So this is about the online meetings and the impact on productivity, diversity of IETF activities. Uh, Nick is responsible for this the group. Okay. Okay, so this is just a brief review of this the hackathon groups. Okay. During the two days of the hackathon activity, we also have the two sync ups meeting. So that's in the sync up meeting. So they we have this the extensive discussion. Uh, most of the discussion is about the date and also the tools, and also introduce this the progress of the hackathon groups. And uh, besides the data and the tools about the hackathon, we also have this the extensive discussion of the different topics, and also this is. Uh, to be honest, beyond my expectation. So that's we talk about the, how to make the work sustained and also how to provide the necessary data. And also that's when do the analysis work and provide the possible data, the privacy issue are involved and also be discussed. I think this is also interest and also related very, closely with the data analysis work. I think also this through the sync up meeting and also there's the a good understanding between the people who are interested in the analysis of ITF data and also the people who are active in the ITF activities. So we can understand each other better. So and also is helpful for the data analysis work, understand what can be done and what cannot be done, and also what's the possible plan for the next step. Okay, so this is just a brief review about the Monday's workshop and also the hackathon groups and the sync up meetings. So then this is today's the agenda. So we will go on to discuss the environmental sustainability. So this is according to the position paper, we have the initial result discussion. So then after that, we will have this the result presentation. 
the for from the different uh, hexagon groups. So that's the, this is the today's the agenda. So this is the, all my uh, presentation for the opening session. So if there's no actor uh, questions, so I will move this to the polling so that for the next topic about the environmental sustainability discussion. Okay. 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 Thank you for the introduction. Um, see if I can work the sharing today. All right, is that working? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I will uh, just be, be very brief here. Uh, so, see, so yeah, I'm, I'm Con Perkins. I'm chairing this uh, the session on uh, initial results on environmental sustainability. Um, this is something where, where we just had two submissions on, on the topic. So, um, uh, and and uh, that they seemed that, like they had some initial uh, results in those submissions. Uh, so, so, so we got submissions from Daniel and from Christoph. Uh, uh, and I know Mir Miriam mentioned these at the uh, be beginning in the introductory session, and I think there's been some discussion uh, on these uh, during the week. And uh, some, I know there was some uh, a small group looking at these during the hackathon. So, uh, uh, what we have for this afternoon is um, um, a, a couple of short presentations from Christoph and from Daniel uh, talking about the, their work and uh, the results of the hackathon. Uh, and then we'll, we'll hopefully have time for a little bit of discussion and we can talk a little bit about what's the ITF's role, role with respect to climate change, um, what's the environmental impact of the way we develop the standards in the ITF, and perhaps uh, more importantly, what's the environmental impact of the standards we develop, uh, which may have uh, pot potentially more of an impact than, than the actual process of developing the standards. Um, so I think there's a bunch of interesting topics to discuss, uh, and I will now switch over to the first presentation, which uh, I believe is going to be Christoph, if that's okay. No, that's all right. Okay, hopefully those slides are readable and big enough. Um, yep. Okay, uh, over to you in that case. All right, yeah, so this is um, um, work that really uh, took um, an active, uh, yeah, took up an activity uh, only during, during the, the hackathon. Um, before that, it was only an idea that was hovering around um, but uh, now that we had the chance to familiarize ourselves more during the week with the ITF data, um, ITF data um, Python package uh, written by um, Stefan and, and Colin, um, it yeah, took much more momentum. And, and this working group was mostly driven by myself, Christoph Becker, and Safik Islam. Um, next slide, please. And so the, the the question focus here is is basically you know trying to use um, the data traces that we have of um, ITF um, to to see to to somehow um, get a notion of to what extent um, climate impacts are being considered in the development and standardization of internet protocols. Um, so you know the process of the decision making of what is of relevance for new protocols, and and not trying to quantify, for example, I don't know the the energy consumption difference in IPv6 or IPv4. Next slide, please. So, in this uh, in this in the beginning of the workshop, we were yeah mapping out a strategy and uh, a methodology how we can um, try to. Um, yeah, assess, assess our, the question that we pose ourselves. And um, 
we take, I guess, a little bit of a similar approach as um, we have seen that um, that of um, Levis uh, did in the NCC group research on on um, potential security vulnerabilities um, um, and how they can be found in the RFCs. So in the beginning, we just um, create a list of relevant keywords. Next slide, please. Um, this list can be considered uh, preliminary, um, which is used to filter out um, relevant pieces of text. So, you know, for example, so, and also, I mean, you will find some of these words are maybe um, more ambiguous. They can um, appear in different contexts. And that's why it's important to later on um, um, yeah, filter out uh, the, the relevant uh, pieces of text that uh, are really concerned about the environment of, of you know, ecology and not the environment of uh, you know, computer infrastructure. And next slide, please. And so, um, yes, the, the data acquisition has been uh, taking up a lot of time. So um, we have tried. I mean, so yeah, here again, it can be argued. I mean, we have tried to to you know to uh, to make an approach um, based on volume. I mean, something that we can finish this week uh, and doesn't take too long. So you know, if you would uh, go through all the mailing archive, I mean, we, we would be busy for for months um, if we don't have uh, the, the necessary CPU power. So. Um, so basically, the the, the smallest uh, amounts of text are uh, with, can be found within the RFCs and the active working group drafts. And um, while we have already finished our initial keyword search for RFCs, um, we are still running our code for um, the drafts of RFCs and the active working group drafts. While um, going through meeting minutes and mailing archives is something that we still need to do. And then in the third step, next slide, please. After the initial keyword search, where we narrow down the body of text that um, we have to go through, we then have to find, as I say, you know, those keywords that can, some of them are more ambiguous than others, that can appear in different kinds of contexts. So then we have to find a more, we have to go through a more complex um, procedure by using NLP. To, to filter out um, you know, what kind of environments the text is speaking to. And um, yeah, in that respect, uh, that, that is something we have not been able to, to, to work on at all uh, during this time. And then the very last step, the envisage, if you go to the next slide, um, that we then, once we have uh, you know, um, found the relevant Body of text that we uh, we go in there and and see exactly uh, verify basically the what the NLP algorithms um, have given us and see exactly the the, the smaller details and, and notions in which um, what these texts are, are talking about and seeing how you now how the the new protocols are, are considering climate impact as something to take into account and. As this is uh, a project that is really just starting and where no one consider, considers themselves as being an expert in, um, you know, we would still be very thankful for any kind of uh, you know, feedback you have, uh, ideas, suggestions. So it's uh, very, very much in its initial stages. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Um, does anyone have any uh, quick comments on this before we go on to the, the other talk? Or any questions on this? Yeah, I mean, Sefiko, yesterday, or you talked a little bit about, uh, like his summary was like the ITF is not very green because there were not, not too many matches. So did you, did you get any insights up to now from this analysis? As I say, yes. I mean, we we were we finished our first analysis of um, RFCs, um, and I mean, there there yeah we have. I mean, um, 
we yeah of all the RFCs we I mean we went through RFC one to uh, you know the, the most recent one and we have basically I mean we can count it on our hands um, the number of documents where we have uh, seen those keywords popping up. Um, I've only had time to look into very few of them personally and see in what kind of context they appeared. And well, yeah, there were one some um, there were some. Uh, um, Oceanogras uh, involved from the University of Santa, Santa Barbara and UCL A. And um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, we have found some body of text already now, but it's really sparse. I mean, it's very few. Yeah. yeah did um, did also, you get yeah, that? In conversation, I had a conversation also yesterday with Daniel Migo, if I pronounce it correctly, I hope. And... Um, <laughs> Um, and yeah, I mean, so, you know, looking down the line, uh, we, we certainly um, will find more results also in the mailing archives where people have been posting on um, their, their opinions on certain um, you know, climate issues. Um, so that is something that's going to show some interesting results. But we have, first have to get there, there, you know, going through the email, uh, mailing archive uh, that takes a considerable more time. Yeah. Maybe second question. Um, I mean, like dot data are great, and it's an interesting question. But mm -hmm. do you do you have an idea about what what kind of recommendation, what kind of insights might come out of this for the ITF or for anything that is actionable? Like, I mean, maybe sure the ITF should should take more into consideration the energy consumption of the protocols we develop or whatever. Or do you think there's anything more concrete? Well, I mean, at the moment, I just maybe yeah, maybe making it a making it a, a point in the minutes uh, at all is maybe already like something that is helpful. What, what I just see at the moment is that that um, you now ICT is, uh, is being considered as you know, something as the solution for the climate issue. Like, we need, like if you see uh, in policy reports or how the UN talks about um, the energy transition, then it's all based and uh, founded on the necessity for smart grids and IoT. So in that sense, it can maybe for this sector, maybe be a free pass of not thinking about their own climate impact at all because they are the solution. So just just maybe you know keeping it or like keeping it or introducing it as a point in the minutes or or in the discussion is already helpful enough in the first instance, and then later on we, we maybe we we'll see that there are some other. Um, steps that can be taken to to um, yeah make yeah give some more concrete results. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank thank you. This is this is really interesting. Uh, did did you see? Uh, I mean, I, I realize you've only looked at the RFCs. Did you see any trends in uh, the discussion? That, you know, is climate change being discussed more in in more recent RFCs, for example, or is it too early to tell? Um, I can't know. It's too too early to tell. Uh, I haven't had the time to look at the, the most recent RFCs. I've um, I, I've just been um, able to to look at um, activities and, and meetings in uh, in um, the ITF um, working groups and other places where they talk about yeah. smart grids and IOTs and but not. Not from in RFCs. I, I didn't have the time for that. No. Okay. okay. All right. Cool. Well, it, it will be interesting to see the results uh, when they're done. So maybe one comment I have. Um, I, I would say that naturally, when we're designing protocols, um, we're trying we're trying to optimize those protocols. So, in that sense, um, 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 there are some concepts that we should uh, probably. Uh, a ban from what we're using, but in general, in terms of bytes, uh, we're trying to optimize that because uh, um, we want our protocol to be pretty efficient. Um, so the, the problem might come uh, with uh, anything that is related to proof of um, of power or um, when, uh, things that requires a lot of um, computations, um, such as um, the one we use in blockchain or um, CGA, um, this kind of mechanisms. Uh, but I would say that um, maybe um, 
um, the, 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 the problem uh, might be more related to, to the architecture. And that's um, maybe more than the ITF, um, uh, IRTF and the IAB might be um, focusing on how to, to make our infrastructure um, greener. That might be um, a topic, I mean, uh, to respond to uh, Mircha's question. Yeah, it's, it's certainly something we should think about. I, I, I'm not sure there are any easy answers, but it's certainly something we should think about. That's another problem. <laughs> right. Just one. Okay, thing. Anna, so... Can I just uh, yeah chime in a bit? Yeah, go. Ahead. Yeah. yeah uh, so as you since you asked uh, uh, Christoph about uh, the recent RFCs mentioning about mentioning keywords like climate and energy. Is that so? Like, I missed that part. Sorry for I joined a bit late because I had to pick my kid up from kindergarten. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I was just asking if there were any obvious trends in in uh, how often climate and energy and so on was mentioned uh, in yes. the RFCs over time. The recent one that I checked actually, like I, I have I have actually like uh, because I sorted them out based on the RFC numbers. Some recent RFCs, like starting like the the most recent one that in talked about climate is RFC 8752 or something like that, but that's only like talking about environment and bracket climate. So it's a false positive. <laughs> and, uh, and also like some other drafts did mention, but I haven't looked at the at the drafts actually, the, the names of the drafts and what they're talking about. But yeah, uh, like from 7,000 cities and 7,000 to between 7,000 to 9,000, I can see that six or seven, six drafts actually mentions climate for uh, 10 times in total. But I'm curious to know actually, maybe that it's, it's good to see like in which context they're using climate. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it would be interesting. Yeah. All right, lo lots more to learn by the sounds of it. So. Okay, uh, should we move on to Daniel's talk? Hey, uh, Colin, I have my hand up. I didn't know if we were still using uh, hands. I'm here. sorry, I, I didn't see you. Please, okay. please go ahead. Um, so but this is just a short, short uh, encouragement for Christoph, um, which is you said, you know, we've gone through the RFCs and now we're grinding through the uh, internet drafts. Um, if when we did the um, initial looking at the effects of Y2K, on the IETF. This was in 1998. Um, we found a couple of RFCs with some concerns, but we actually found a bunch of active internet drafts that had more dangerous things in them than in the RFCs. So uh, I encourage you to uh, look through, you know, even though RFCs have a uh, higher standing um, in the IETF, I encourage you to keep looking at the drafts and to dig down further there because uh, that when we fixed a few, we didn't have to fix much for the Y2K things. Um, but when we did fix things, it was almost all in active internet drafts that might have dropped, you know, might have gotten completed after the initial analysis. So uh, keep going. And I wouldn't surprise me if you found more um, useful and interesting things in the drafts than in RFCs. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Rob, Robin, do you have a question? Okay. Uh, in fact, this almost uh, five years ago, uh, there's the uh, several uh, work items in the routing area. That time, they talk about the uh, light, how are we networking? So that's they discussed about how to uh, advertise this the energy consuming information of the link and this is the device so that is uh, according to collect uh, the power say uh, power consuming information to calculate the possible path so that time is uh, that time is a very popular topic but uh, later they found that this is the topic is uh, the the requirement may be too early so that's uh, this work is uh, does not did not move on so and also all the all are uh, all most uh, 
most of the draft are the individual draft and the expired. But now you know that uh, the for the CXG network, so the climate change and the power saving are very important requirement. So I think that maybe there are some more draft and this the possible RFC are related with this one because now the requirement maybe become more popular. So I uh, hope that maybe uh, in the future there may be more work either in the IETF about this topic. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. My my connection is struggling, so I, um, I can't tell if it's just me or anyone else. Uh, so, so, so I missed half of that, but thank you for the comment. Hey, Colin, it's Corinne. Can you hear me? Um, I raised my hand, but I'll, I'll jump in because you're, you lost your connection. Um, I wanted to do the same thing as, as the previous speakers and that is, you know, really encourage this work. I think it's incredibly important. Um, I really appreciate it. It's also great to hear that you've been speaking to Michael uh, Ogia about this. Um, another thing that I wanted to maybe flag is that the Ford foundation is actually also working specifically on issues of like internet infrastructure and sustainability. Um, so I don't know if you know anyone there, but it might be interesting to have a conversation with them as well, because obviously you're doing incredibly practical work and I'm sure they would be uh, interested to learn more about it. So feel free to um, shoot me a message about that and, uh, and I'll see what I can do. Well, thanks a lot for, for all your comments and suggestions. Um, it's very motivating. Thank you. And uh, if, if I could add to the choir, is that there have been so like alternative internet uh, infrastructures such as Scion have been making quite some claims about um, more efficient routing, which would cause less carbon emissions. I'm not sure what that's actually been substantiated and not could be done with other approaches such as AS sets. But I do hope that your analysis could perhaps spark such discussions and in the ANRP, there have already been interesting papers on this topic. So, yeah, I really hope that this work can also find a place uh, in the IETF and that the analysis itself can spark for the discussion. So another, uh, another great point for uh, kudos and uh, stimulation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hopefully I, I am back. My, my connection seems to be struggling. Uh, I think in, in the interest of time, I think we probably need to move on to the, the, the next presentation. Um, D Daniel, if you, if you can share it yourself, that may, uh, may be better given the way okay. my connection is struggling. Can it, can everyone see it? Um, yeah, yes, we, we, we see the present the, um, speakers uh, view of the notes rather than the presentation, but it's visible. Okay. So, um, so, um, what I'm going to talk, um, today is, um, um, an estimation of the CO2. Um, emission due to um, ITF meetings. And for that, I developed um, a tool which I, which I named a CO2 e equivalent. So before I start, um, I mean, I'm just mentioning that um, um, what I'm saying through this presentation is uh, only my own opinion, personal opinion, and does not express um, Ericsson's view. Um, but Ericsson is also doing some work on the sustainability and, um, well, it is uh, left for, um, future work. Um, so the basic question I, I, I was asking to myself, um, were pretty simple is uh, how sustainable are ITF meetings? And, um, so I, I tried to, to say how much CO2 emission is, a uh, um, each, each of our meetings are responsible for, and um, is there any way to make um, the ITF 
as an organization more uh, sustainable. Um, so we had some uh, chat conversation, um, um, but uh, I tried to to try to um, to provide some numbers around that. So um, how much CO two um, do we have? Um, so the, the problem, I mean, so, so I'm currently only focusing on air flight, um, uh, um, the CO2 emissions associated to air flight. And um, the problem I had is that, um, well, we have to estimate which flight each um, of the attendees are taking. And um, 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 I mean, flights are not always direct from um, the origin of the attendee to um, to the, the meeting location. So we, I mean, I, I want to, to be able to estimate um, a real flight where uh, with multiple connections. And then once, I, once you have those uh, multiple legs, you can estimate uh, using some models, what is the CO2 associated for each legs. And um, I use two, two, um, two ways to, to estimate the CO2. One is the one documented by uh, my climate, and the other way I use the services um, provided by Go Climate. Um, so one is implemented in my application, and the other one is just a, a query I'm sending to uh, Go Climate. So, well, I'd like to thank them for um, give, give me access to to that service. So I did that for every participant and. Um, every ITF meetings. And uh, on the diagram here, um, I plotted um, according to, so each attendee can be uh, on-site, an on-site attendee, a remote attendee, or um, an attendee that's not arrived. So for each of these participants, I took the origin location and um, I, I estimate a flight. So um, a real flight, multiple segments and so on. And I estimate from that the CO2 for each of those participants. Um, so basically, the effective um, CO2 is um, um, is um, is the one associated to uh, participants that are on site. But I, I computed that CO2 for um, every participant, and. Um, um, if you consider only the on-site participant, I, I'm, I mean, and you take the average of um, every meeting, um, you can see that um, on average, um, one ITF meeting is uh, uh, emitting um, th 3.2 gigagram of CO2. So for each of this meeting, which on average represent 2.7 tons of CO2 per attendee for every meeting. So the, the question is that, yeah, how much is uh, 2.7 tons of CO2 and uh, what uh, these numbers um, actually mean? So for that, I, I, I tried to estimate, um, I, I, I took some data um, about how much CO2 per capita are being emitted for um, different countries. And I tried to compare um, I mean, um, how much is one attending to one meeting, two meetings, three meetings? And um, so one way to represent that is um, when you see on the map. So, um, I mean, one uh, 2.7 is here for one ITF meeting. Um, two, dot, uh, two meetings, attending to two meetings, uh, you, you, you likely change category. And um, I mean, uh, three meetings are your um is uh, is over there so i mean we do actually get into the dark um color and 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 just to be clear it only represents the co2 that is um needed um to attend a meeting versus uh the co2 that uh, one person in a given country is ne needing to um to basically leave a year um so if you go, I mean, the same uh, data, uh, it's, it's just a, uh, another representation of the data um, because, I mean, uh, I could have a list. I mean, this website, the uh, world data is providing a list on per country. 
And uh, basically what we realized is that if you attend three ITF meetings, it represents, uh, you emit a, as much as CO2 as um, the average person living in Germany or Poland, which are um, countries known to, um, European countries known to um, emit quite a lot of CO2 because um, they do generate um, energy based on coal. Um, if you attend two meetings, you have some um, uh, European countries such like Greece, Italy, UK. Uh, one meeting, um, I mean, um, in this area, uh, you have a, um, the CO2 per capita is closer to Mauritius or Venezuela, but um, I mean, it's hard to to, to figure out what um, um, people living in Venezuela, um, what kind of lifestyle they have, but um, it's just a number of found. Um, yeah, so that's, um, so that's uh, the, the, what I found first. And then um, I said, yeah, because we are mostly focused on um, aviation, um, um, I try to, 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 to look at um, uh, what are the sustainable paths for the aviation in general? So that's um, another um, comparison I try to figure out. So today, aviation is responsible to 4% um, of um, um, the CO2 emission equivalent um, um, that uh, is causing global warming. And um, a recent study um, tried to figure out um, how much COVID has impact aviation emissions and uh, how to, um, to leverage from that um, decrease in aviation. And so they, they basically compared what uh, uh, they envisioned different scenarios for, for aviation from now, how they recover from COVID, and how it's going on until 2050. And they evaluate for, for each of those scenario, how much degree uh, of increase uh, the aviation is, will be responsible for each of those scenario. So for those scenario, there are basically two, um, two growth that are being estimated. Uh, a post COVID um, growth, um, I mean, to recover from the COVID, uh, pandemic and uh, that growth is going from now to 2024. And then you have another growth from 24 to uh, 2050. And so they had a, the no pandemic uh, situation, which means as if we had no pandemic. And um, so um, aviation is basically growing 3% um, per year. And if, if, we if we had taken that path, um, I mean, aviation would be responsible of the increase of um, 0.1 deg degrees Celsius. Um, so the big conclusion is that even if we had um, a, a, a massive um, stop um, due to the COVID-19, I mean, the impact of that uh, crisis, um, if we don't do anything, is, is mostly slightly delaying by five years um, um, what would have happened without uh, the pandemic, for example. So, I mean, um, if we are say, um, maybe thinking that, oh, because of the COVID, we, um, I mean, we, we are not safe at all, even uh, um, with that um, COVID pandemic. And so, they, 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 I mean, uh, we have uh, basically um, the back to normal. So you have a, a, um, an increase. Um, during uh, until uh, of 16% until 2024, and then you go back to 3% per year. Then you have the zero long-term growth, so you have a slighter increase, 13%, and then no increase at all, so um, um, after 2024. And then you have the long-term decrease, decline, uh, which is a 10%, so a shorter uh, growth, and then you have a decrease. and um, that scenario is uh, responsible for um, only 0 0.04 degree increase. And what, what we need to consider is that um, even if you stop aviation now and no flight at all, um, aviation will still be responsible in, in 2050 of, um, 
I mean, some increase of temperature because it's what what really matters um, is the accumulation. So, um, I mean, um, whatever solution we find, uh, we will never go to zero. So, what I did is I took those scenarios for the aviation and I tried to apply those to, um, I mean, the air flights uh, involved for the ITF. And um, so, I mean, it's an approximation. I mean, um, I mean, um, so what I took is the the scenario, for example, uh, no, no pandemic. Um, I mean, in, in the case of the ITF, we're not increasing the meetings. Um, so I mean, they're they're going to remain uh, three meetings. Um, well, I could maybe um, consider additional interim meetings and so on, but this is not what I did. And so if we apply all those scenarios, we find out that the zero long term um, ends with two meetings and the one that is, um, um, I mean, uh, fulfilling um, more um, um, agreements um, is um, leading to one meeting uh, per year, at least until 2050. So, um, I mean, this is only a start. Um, um, and um, so um, what I uh, found out is um, 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 maybe we could um, um, envision um, to um, limit the number of meetings to one per year, um, given the, how much CO2 uh, one, one meeting is um, involving, and uh, given um, the trends the sustainable trends for aviation, uh, as well as uh, what is uh, science uh, urging everyone to do. So we should probably t be, be part of that effort. Um, then um, I, I think if we know um, there is a high chance that we become more vi virtual, um, we should um, increase the, info to, uh, the effort to improve the remote experience. So. I'm not actually saying that no effort is being made. I mean, I, I know there are a lot of effort, especially, um, I mean, the, the Mitico teams or even, I mean, things that are not obvious, but uh, um, um, we, during the virtual meetings, uh, I think doing the agenda and uh, choosing the time slot and all this is, as um, have not been part of that effort, but I'm, I, I can see that um, a lot of effort has been, um, put on that. So, um, I mean, that's, uh, I think that's really good. And then um, a third point is that um, we don't have to reinvent uh, everything uh, um, ourselves, but uh, if we want to be a little, to be more sustainable, we can um, take part of some uh, specific programs such as the Global Compact or uh, the Caring for Climate Initiative that would uh, help us to, to define a, a strategy that is uh, sustainable. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's uh, so, something that is ongoing, but um, I would say that it might be good to adhere to such programs to, um, to take, I mean, um, to do the right thing. Okay, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm just, um, um, yeah, so I, I think my presentation is, uh, is over. Um, I put uh, some uh, references here and um, I welcome any feedbacks or um, suggestions, questions. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. That's really interesting results. Um, I, I saw a couple of questions in the chat. I think Robert had some questions there. Uh, I'm conscious that we're a little late, but we, we, I think we have time for, for a couple of questions. Yeah, super fast. Did your flight model assume one airplane per participant, or did it did it or the underlying tools take into account that um, the participants traveling tend to clump into airplanes, so shared rides are a big thing? Um, so I, I, I don't understand the question. So. Um, what I took as a model, so um, 
is the, the, the share of CO2 uh, associated per passenger. So and the underlying models don't, the, it's just being a passenger that, that if, if you happen to be a passenger on a plane with 100 other IETFers, it has no effect as if you were on a plane all by your, and there were no other IETFers on it. Yeah, yeah, that's the same. I mean, it's a, um, yeah, it's a, um, it's a, it's a per passenger and uh, that you fly in the same plane or in another plane. It's the same. Okay. Um, any other very quick questions? Uh, Niels, do you have your hand up? Well, I think this is extremely impactful work, which actually could find its way into several working groups in the IETF talking about this. So I really hope that Daniel will present that work there as well. Do you have such plans, Daniel? Um, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, if, uh, if I, uh, if I can, um, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, the, the, the working group, I thought that might be interested, uh, might be Shmu. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I am interested in, um, in presenting that, um, to anyone that, uh, would be interested. <laughs> I, I suspect the Gaia group in IRTF might also be interested. Okay. But, uh, Sh Shmoo is possibly more relevant for the meeting planning of Gaia for general sustainability. Um, Niels, Neil, were you done? Yeah, yeah, I'm done. I'm just, yeah, I, I just really like how this, how this work really um, uh, uh, makes things very concrete and tangible. So thanks, thanks so much for this work. It's really excellent. Um, Maria. Yes, yeah, so your conclusion was we should go down to, I guess, one in-person meeting per, um, per year. Um, but your graph didn't include zero in-person meetings, right? Isn't zero? I mean, like, this is not a surprising result for me. Every in-person meeting has, uh, has some CO2 cost because of the travel. Um, so wouldn't zero be better? And like, what's, what's about local attendance? Um, or is, you know, is it, is it everybody should have one meeting where everybody flies to, or is it like everybody should just go to the local meeting and not travel to the other meetings? Um, also, so that's, um, that's really to discuss. I, I, I think, um, yeah, of course, if we go to zero, that's better, uh, in terms of CO2. Um, but, um, I, I think we. I mean, um, the the way I see that is, uh, um, we might we might have a transition with a uh, one meeting per year, um, and then uh, I mean, uh, we have a few years to decide if if we go to zero or if we keep to one. Um, um, I think the most important thing for now is uh, not I mean to try to 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 limit uh, the the number of meeting and to lower that number. Um, um, and and then um, I think that re it requires more work. I would say um, it might be better to have one meeting everyone goes to. Um, but uh, then, uh, of course, uh, I mean, it's probably, I, I think uh, hybrid meetings are going to be very, very challenging. So that's, uh, um, I have the impression it's uh, it's better to, um, to try to, to have everyone, I mean, if we want to, to have those, uh, face to face discussion, it's better that everyone is in the same room. Uh, so, and, uh, so, and, um, uh, how to take the local attendance, uh, it's interesting because, well, because I computed CO2 and, um, I also produce, um, in the paper, some, some graphs, um, um, so, um, that. So taking the CO2 emission as opposed as the number of attendees. And uh, it might be a useful metrics and it's, it's an open questions to um, maybe evaluate some of the meetings. Um, and uh, the main difference between um, CO2 emissions and the number of attendees, if you just consider that as a metric, 
is that you remove the local um, aspect of the meetings. Because, I mean, uh, people that are uh, very local that go, uh, that attending a meeting, I mean, they spend, uh, um, they generate less CO2 than the one uh, coming from the other side of the planet. Um, so so it, it might be interesting because it removes this uh, local aspect and um, maybe it gives us something smoother to, um, to see some trends or um, maybe consideration. So I think it might also be um, uh, a nice angle to, to look at, um, um, to analyze um, the evolution of the ITF or the growth, potential growth of the ITF. But from the graph here, I, I think it's pretty um, clear, at least to me, that uh, there is a, a growth uh, associated to the remote participation. So um, it's probably the way we can grow the ITF as well. And uh, the example that came to me is that it's very hard if you're working with students or um, other people and you try to engage them to the ITF. Um, I mean, if you, you say to the student, yeah, you're going to work for that draft, but you, you're never going to go to the ITF meeting. Um, it's not as motivating, for example, to say, yeah, I mean, ITF can be virtually attended and uh, we are doing those two meetings. We can do that meetings together. So for local engagement, I think it might also be helpful to um, um, and, and very beneficial to for the ITF to have those uh, uh, virtual meetings. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I see. Uh, I'm conscious of the time. I, I see Christoph and Corin and Robert in queue, uh, and then uh, that, at that point we'll have to cut the queue. Uh, if if we can try and have quick, quick, quick-ish questions and answers, please. Yeah, mine is an old hand, so ignore that. Old hand. Okay. Yeah, this work is very, very great. Thanks for presenting it. Um, and I was just wondering. Um, I, mean, I didn't understand. I think I didn't fully understand all aspects of it. Um, and I was wondering um, how you how you, you how you think about um, carrying it further. Are you thinking about? Um, I mean, so if he if I mean, there's a lot of work going on, and I mean, they're already um, you know uh, it's already used um, like sustainable aviation fu fuels. Are, are you taking this into consideration? Maybe. Are you thinking of taking this into consideration? Maybe if you, you know, going to evaluate it further. And I mean, it's going to be there by by you know by 2030 uh, for sure and earlier of, of course as well. Um, so and whether there's you no know, kind of like policy interventions you you're envisaging. Um, is this also, yeah, as you say, I mean, you know, if someone's traveling locally, they will consume less. So, you know, when you say that uh, an attendee um, is restricted to like you know, attending one meeting per year, um, are you also may maybe thinking about like, you know, depending on where the, where, like the, the flight path that would be, need to be taken, whether this is also going to play? So, well? yeah, so I, I am not a specialist in aviation, so I mean the fuel. I, I'm waiting that these uh, biofuels are are there to con to consider those in the model. Um, I know the paper I am based on um, also evaluated some um, um, some uh, scenario where you have some more um, uh, biofuels and so on and so on. But uh, you know, um, I, I I'm I mean um, it, it starts to be very complex and it's a uh, and, and then it's very easy to, I mean, I mean, um, I am not working in the aviation sector, so I didn't want to make a, a complex model that is um, um, maybe completely um, out of scope. So, uh, I mean, currently this is um, the most, I mean, basic uh, model I am applying to. Um, and uh, but yeah, it might it might change the the data if um, if I mean if aviation I mean if aviation does not provide any CO two then yeah it's uh, it's going to be completely different then um, that that is going to be available in 2030 um, I I mean um, politicians are saying so um, I mean uh, the uh, there are a lot of funding for that but um, 
I mean, um, you know, it's like Galileo. I mean, uh, the time it took, uh, it took more time than expected. So I'm waiting for that to be uh, more concrete. Um, um, so it's, 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 it's a difficult problem and, and it's not clear if, if any of these are, are going to turn into reality. Yeah, that's, um, yeah. so that's um, yeah. one thing. And, but um, one thing I also checked and that's, um, uh, I have been suggested that um, um, to look at the number of uh, connections people are using to attend a meeting. And um, for example, if you want to, um, for example, provide a safer location regarding the virus, um, 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 I mean, uh, I mean, assuming that the the more connection you have, the more time you're going to spend on air, on airports, and uh, the the higher the probability would be that you um, either catch the virus or uh, that you um, participate to the spreading of the virus. Um, um, uh, is um, so I looked at the number of legs uh, per locations. It's not very clear um, what the strategy could be, but um, uh, further work is probably needed uh, around that. Um, I think I found that uh, Japan, China, and um, and yeah, probably. I mean, it's, it's... It's it's it's, it's, a, it's it's a difficult problem. Uh, I, I, I'm very conscious that, that we're, we're running way over time here. Um, oh, okay, right. Clearly, okay. A, a lot more we <laughs> clearly a lot more we can do in this space, uh, uh, and hopefully we we can get some collaborations kickstarting uh, as a result of this. Um, so the the agenda I think had a, a break until 15 minutes past. Uh, do we want to go with that, or do we want to? Uh, want to delay the start of the next bit slightly more. I'm really keen on seeing the hackathon results. <laughs> yeah, I'm also happy to come back in 15 minutes and not delay. Okay, in that case, let's come back at about quarter past uh, for the next, the next session. And okay. everyone who has slides for the next session, feel free to email them to me as a backup and as an archive. So see you all in 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, Robert? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure I um, I uh, I already answer your question, um, but um, now I, I might have more time. So I so I w I was wondering if you you you're saying that if I'm traveling from Paris to Beijing, is that the same than if I am traveling flying from um, let's say the same distance from uh, Kenya to no um, no. No, my my question was, did how did the how did the the travel model deal with the fact that when, for instance, there is an IETF meeting in Europe, the planes that I am on for the leg over the Atlantic tend to have between fifty and a hundred IETFers on it. So it's one one plane carrying those hundred people as opposed to a hundred planes carrying those hundred people. Yeah. So uh, I mean, the unit is not the plane. Is um, you as a passenger. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, um, for each plane, each leg, you have a, a certain quantity of CO two that is associated to the flight, and then you divide that by the number of passenger. Uh, and considering also the um, the class, yeah. so the you're class. you're you're then you're relying on the metric coming out of your underlying tools that is a per passenger metric, and baked into that is some assumption about averaging all the passengers out over all of the existing flights, so that yeah, there, there's an assumption that the distribution of the um, 
IETF passengers on these planes matches the general distribution of the population on planes, and we know that's not true. So I suspect that your um, the 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 values that you're getting um, rather significantly overstate the 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 CO two consumption um, because we aren't um, as spread out over planes as the general population would be that there is a that they're okay. saving through concentration. So um, the difference would be. Um... It's not the same that 10 person, uh, 10 attendee fly from SF to, uh, let's say, London as uh, one person from uh, San Francisco, another one from Atlanta, another one from Johannesburg, and one from Beijing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I agree. So, um, the current model I am applying to, yes, they do define some... Um, um, uh, general, um, they quantified that, and uh, um, it's it's the same uh, everywhere around the world. So, one, for example, uh, what could change the data would be probably um, a flight from Kenya to, um, let's say, um, Abu Dhabi might be half empty, while a plane from um, San Francisco to uh, London might be full. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I know that ICAO has, um, I mean, they use those data and do have some slight differences by regions. Um, so that might be um, um, something, um, um, I mean, uh, the, the, I mean, um, to have the cargo, uh, the cargo load and the passenger load, but might differ per region. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is currently. I'm not considering that. Uh, um, I, 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 the model, I, the model I'm using. Um, I don't think they are considering that. Right. My climate for sure is not. Go climate because I'm relying on the service. Looking at the specification, it does not. But I don't know what they do behind the <laughs> behind what they say they do. Yeah, it would be interesting to see at some point that um, the uh, if these services provide an API where you could actually. Um, um, talk about um the the flight sharing like the 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 typical load on on flight shares so instead of speaking per passengers you speak more towards um flights and and you use people's origins and destinations and make some sort of estimate on um how how likely they are to be traveling together and see how much of an impact it has. I mean, the, that, I think that the, the, the general shape of the data that you've got is going to be quite similar. Um, but the, the raw numbers and the places where, you know, you have the intersections with the, um, um, the amount of energy needed to survive for a year in, in a given um, country would, would shift. So, oh, um, yeah. I mean, uh, that's. Uh, I mean, uh, un unless we we don't have the um, the data, it's hard to speculate. What I heard is that um, from people working on the, I mean, um, really working on the model to estimate the energy. Really this the, the the feedback I received is that Go Climate and My Climate are probably underestimating. Um, those um so yeah so that's yeah. um i would like i mean the first step i would like to do is to include the icao uh which is taking um considering those uh, differences between the regions um uh, i have to look how to do that because i mean they do have um a service but it's a paid one um 
so yeah, so that's a that's a maybe. I don't think. I mean, I checked manually some of the flights, and I did not find um, uh, more than more difference than I found between the uh, Go Climate and um, and my climate. It's um, um, because you you yeah. already have a lot of estimation. For example, the load, the cargo load. Um, how you estimate? I mean the the portion associated to passenger versus the um, I mean the load, which are the merchandise or um, this kind of things. And some are using tons, some are using dollars, so uh, you don't have the same numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's um, I mean of course if you're using um, I mean you could. Uh, uh, do uh, refine that on a per plane uh, type. If you're using a Boeing or an Airbus, it might be slightly different. Um, but um, I mean, um, I, I, I mean, those have been um, slightly even even if you consider um, uh, short short haul planes and long haul planes. Which uh, you could think uh, uh, makes a, a huge difference. Well, for a given flight, the difference is not that much. I mean, uh, if I so, I mean, if I plot for you the CO2 according to the distance using those two types of planes, um, I mean, there is a small difference, but it's not a huge one. You you will probably not see see it until I I, I give you the equations. <laughs> Actually, Actually, are you involved in the um, in the um, the tool team at the ITF? I think you were. Yeah, I'm the tools team chair. At this oh point. yeah, okay. Because I'm trying, I'm fighting with the GitHub uh, pages. Uh, I, I don't know if you um, if that's something you you've looked. Um... GitHub pages for what? Oh, for um. So Happy to chat, oh. but you, then you know this is recorded and will go on uh, YouTube. Okay. Right? <laughs> but you can keep chatting. Just want to remind you. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, um, when because I I, I put the, my code on the um, on GitHub, and um, GitHub is providing um, uh, static web pages. Um, that they host on the on the on the GitHub dot io. Yeah, I can point you to some people that can help you with with setting that stuff up if it's not working easily for you. Yeah, it's. I mean, uh, I, I I I'm I'm happy to have those contact um, uh, pers so, so those uh, names. Um, but I I'm, I'm finding that um, yeah, Markdown is very good. Unless, um, and then if if you start using uh, using using it in a not so basic uh, uh, thing, uh, things might uh, things are much uh, rapidly very complex. <laughs> yep. <laughs> With a lot of flavors, um, so I'm actually yeah the the, the <laughs> number of different variants of Markdown that are in the world right now is a is an issue. Mm -hmm. I um I need to look uh, prob probably ASCII doc. Uh... <laughs>
And here we are back at 15 past the dot. So um, welcome all back for the session on the presentation of the hackathon work been done in the uh, last two days. And uh, according to the hackathon groups, we're going to start with uh, group two, because I think uh, group one never really populated. So I'll start with the work in group two that was uh, coordinated by uh, Stephen McQuiston. Uh, Stephen, uh, uh, would you like to present or share your slides or hand over to someone else? Or would you like me to share the slides? Whatever you prefer. Um, so if you can share the slides. Um... I think different people have added their own to it, so I'll let them go through their own particular slides, if you're able to share. I'm trying right now, so let me see how this works. And sharing now is giving me some trouble. Uh, Mirja or Stephen, could you see if you could share? Uh, where are the slides? In the GitHub. For group two. It's not going to let me share them with a critic. Ah, uh, Miria seems to be the saver of the day. Excellent. Thanks so much, Miria. Stephen, take it away. Okay. Um, so this was a diversity and inclusion um, group in the hackathon. Um, we sort of splintered off into individual sort of specific projects that we each worked on, and uh, as a result, we've got a, a sort of set of slides that we've each added a couple of slides to. So if we go to the next one. I don't know whose slide this is, admittedly, um, but uh, whoever it is, uh, if they want to, to talk through it. If they're here, that's the question. Yeah, wasn't Wes maybe doing this? Is Wes here? It was not my slide. That's not your slide, okay. No, that was my slide. <laughs> I can't even recognize my own slide. <laughs> Well, I originally put it later in the deck, so I thought there was no way I was first. All right, I'm, I apologize. So uh, one of the things I I've been looking at measuring is international cooperation in a number of different ways. And uh, I took some past work that I did were analyzing email archives to extract, you know, what systems are communicating with what other systems. Uh, so I took the top 20 mailing lists from 2020. Thank you to someone, I'm blanking on the name, who supplied me that list of, of the top most mailing lists. Uh, included things like you know get uh, quick issues and things like that and i parsed the headers to look through you know where where is traffic coming from and then i created a node node edge graph out of that and then plotted it um of course the the hardest part about that is you know where is traffic coming from as uh, i think everybody knows determining source countries of traffic is uh, very challenging um, especially when you only have names actually ip addresses are easier um so in the results, you know, I do have some interesting proof of concept uh, success that makes me think this is worthwhile to continue looking at. Um, there's a lot more work to be done in terms of collecting data as well as cleaning it and, and better parsing it. That's actually, I think, where the majority of the effort is. And then, you know, it would be nice to tie it to other data systems as well, like the, the data tracker to, you know, email addresses is in there too. But one of the things I, the reason I approached for email instead of just starting with a data tracker was uh, I wanted to collect information. 
I went to, you know, there's there's other participants that, that correspond on mailing lists that are not necessarily in the data tracker um, because the data tracker is really people that have just attended IETFs and submitted drafts and done things like that. Whereas we know that there's people that just, you know, participate on the mailing list only, for example. Next slide. Uh, so this is my initial results, and it, it's uh, both interesting in what it shows and it also shows that how broken it is. So all of the diamond shapes, which are um, uh, light and hard to see, but you can see the name of the working groups in particular. You can see sort of DNS op at the top middle, ADD on the far left, um, working group chairs, TX off and V6 off are on the far right. And then they're connected by country dots for who actually contributed to that particular working group. Now, the reason I know this is very broken is because it shouldn't be the segmented, right? Almost all countries should be contributing to most groups. And yet, uh, for some reason, uh, RO on the right-hand side, which is that Romania? I'm not sure. Is like the only country contributing to v 6 ox TX, Auth, and working group chairs? That makes no sense, right? Um, you know, I happen to know that I'm in the United States and contributed a lot in, in 2020 to DNS op, but yet the U.S. isn't in there, which is where I live. So there's work to be done to increase the data, but it at least begins to show me that this sort of, um, you know, graphic pictorial, I actually intended to, to duplicate all the countries around each of the working groups um, just to make it cleaner in the long run so it wouldn't be such a mess. But the initial plot came out so clean that I decided to include that instead because there was no need to do that, that separation. Uh, so, you know, the other interesting thing I realized the study would be, you know, if I can do this just for 2020 with even more working groups and cleaner data, comparing it to 2018 or something like that to see, you know, is there any differences between in pandemic and, and out? I doubt it, but it would be interesting to see. So uh, that's where I am. A lot more work is needed, but I actually did get some stuff done this week. And that's it for me. Wes, a quick question. What exactly did you do to uh, get to the uh, country? Um, I parsed the received headers for where mail was actually coming from. And then from that, um, I either tried to, use, if, if the IP address was in it, then I would use um, standard databases for determining IP addresses. I didn't use standard database <clears throat> from 2020. So the other thing to do would be, you know, collecting uh, mappings over time and, and trying to pick one from near that time period because uh, address allocations do change around the world. Um, if the server name was uh, not available, I would actually try and resolve it to an IP address. And if that wasn't available, I would actually use the two-letter country code if it came through something um, with a two-letter TLD. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, things like Gmail are, you know, completely useless for doing determination, right? Um, so that's actually where falling back to like the data tracker or something might be more helpful. Okay. Yeah, that's probably I was, it's, it's one source sorry, of the brokenness I, I, here. Yeah. Sorry, I, I keep trying to learn how to raise my hand, but uh, it's going to be failing at least. I'm not staring at the participant list, I'm sorry. Um, no, I was just thinking that uh, maybe something that uh, could be interesting is to look at the affiliation of the participants that uh, another of the head on groups uh, has done, uh, map those affiliations to countries, though of course in many cases you will have global countries, and see what the results of that are, because I guess that there is tons of people in the ITF that spend half of their life inside of a plane or an airport. Yeah, and uh, that's actually what I sort of said, that tying it to the data tracker would be another interesting you know, way to approach. And it would actually be interesting to figure out if data from somebody identifying in a country in the data tracker is actually sending mail from a large number of places or, or you know, routinely not living in the country that they say that they're associating with, for example. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. I think, Daniel, you have your hand up. Is that old or is that for now? It's old. All right. Okay. Next. Yeah, and this is this is me. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have that much time this week to do this. I, I will return to it. I did two two things though. So one one is I, I checked the, the exact status of the gender analysis that I had there, um, and that is actually now discontinued. It was removed as part of the GDPR changes a few years back. Um, because I didn't want to uh, provide any sort of personal information in the 
per person entries, but um, it would be possible to bring back the aggregate, but probably not with the current scheme. One would uh, rather want to go to the highest quality libraries available elsewhere in the, in the world. So it's possible, but maybe not high priority. But one thing that I, I, I did learn this week, and this is, I guess, more generally the type of thing that, that this workshop is for, that we learned that, oh, those people have this interesting data that I could use for this. And so, so I understood that uh, Niels and Nick and so on uh, were working on some classifications of organizations that I'm, I'm sure they will talk about more in a bit. Um, I could really use this because I have, you know, company crafts and country and uh, continent crafts, and I could easily make like operator versus vendor versus academic plot. I think that would be really interesting. So, but I'm not going to do it myself. Uh, I will wait for <laughs> for the source data of the classification to be avail available and then hack on it um, in the rest of the year, I think. Um, maybe we go to the next slide also because. Um, I added this slide as well, and this is because we did have some discussion of the privacy considerations, and I guess this is not sort of a, a comprehensive treatment of the topic. It's just to flag this, that this is also important. The IETF has been relatively conservative about collecting any extra data, and we, we ask for permissions, but at, at the same time, it's important we actually have some transparency and we can understand like what's actually going on like if if uh, let's say one company is doing all the all the standards or half of the standards in the internet that would be interesting information or if some you know parts of the world or types of organizations are not involved at all that would also be interesting and perhaps lead to some action but it is important to follow the you know ethical rules or principles for for research and also legal aspects are, are involved. Um, so I guess uh, mostly what we'll be doing is aggregation and avoiding displaying unnecessary information. As an example of that, I indeed did remove from the uh, author stats uh, previously they listed for each person, like their employment and so on, that, that the information is gone. Um, so it's only publications available. And then for companies, there's more information. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to flag. Um, and if people can discuss, uh, we, we can, but I'm not sure I have any particular answers on this privacy aspect, at least. If I can hop in, just because um, the, the issue that Yari just mentioned in terms of ethical guidelines, I mean, obviously, all the people who've been presenting here have been doing so, at least the academics, obviously, I assume, um, having gone through some sort of ethical review of the university system. Um, but that is a thing that we might want to consider for our next meeting in terms of, you know, w what are we comfortable with? What guidelines shall we follow to, to make sure that, you know, we uphold the same kind of high standards that uh, that universities do? Before we go away from what Corinne just said, um, that to me is an especially interesting question, not just in the ITF, but in every non-academic multi-stakeholder community, which is who would be the ethics committee? Um, uh, Wes pointed out the other day that ICANN, you know, has a lot of participants and such like that. Um, and we have an ombudsman and such like that, but it's much, much less formal than any academic community has. So um, a, I, I think it would be very valuable if a group of academics tried to figure out how a multi-stakeholder organization such as the IETF could have an ethics committee that would be valuable and um, respected. I have no idea how to start that, but I think that with things like Yari just brought up of we need to, you know, somebody needs to be able to look under the hood to make sure we're actually doing it correctly. I That would be wonderful for the IETF and I think that that would be useful um, in many other multi-stakeholder communities as well. I think it would be useful if, well, I mean, I, th I think that that would be really useful uh, if, if rather difficult, but I think a, a sort of more, 
a perhaps slightly easier task would be to sort of document what the IETF thinks is re reasonable uses. And that might be a, a, a something that's achievable relatively quickly. Yeah, I mean, the, the UNI project, which is looking at censorship, um, has kind of extensive, I mean, this is a very sensitive topic, but has kind of extensive guidelines about how to um, use their platform correctly to do um, uh, studies that are ethically um, acceptable. So I, I think we could actually put a little more guidance about what's okay to do with the data and what's not okay to do with the data and how to do it correctly. Uh, should I move to the next slide? Um, yep, so this is this is me. Um, I was looking at uh, using Python libraries to try and um, determine the gender of meeting registrations, the participants that have registered for meetings. Um, so basically I fetched the, the meeting registrations using the ITF data library and then fed them into one of these Python libraries. Um, the one I used was gender guesser. Um, just a few sort of caveats, I guess. The, the library simply doesn't have a mapping for around a quarter of the names in the meeting registration data set. Um, there's almost certainly biases in the data set the library is using, um, but those aren't well documented and they're not clear. It's not clear how they line up with the, the biases that are, are in the ITF data set. Um, and finally, you know, it would clearly be better to to use sort of a self self declared gender identity field, um, and that's that's something that the ITF community survey has actually started doing in twenty twenty one. So the most recent survey, um, so that data should be available uh, starting this year. But, but of course, it it misses out all of the historical data, and so something like this is maybe useful for looking at that that old data. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So um, so sorry for interrupting you, and maybe sure. Robert knows that better than I, but like, I thought we had self-declared identity in the uh, meeting registration form for a long time, maybe it's still there, uh, but I guess this data is not um, publicly available. It is not publicly available, and I don't believe that it is stored um, directly against okay. the name, that it just goes into an, an, an anonymous aggregator immediately. Okay, but I mean, this, this aggregated data would maybe be interesting to provide. No, but not for this case. Okay, anyway, <laughs> go on. Yeah, no, I, I agree though. I think if, if that aggregate data is there, then you know, that would be useful to, to have as well. Um, so if you go to the next slide, it basically plots the results that I found. Um, you know, there's two main takeaways, I guess. Um, unsurprisingly, the IETF is overwhelmingly male. Um, this maps broadly to the results from the community survey. I think it was about 85%. Um, of respondents uh, said that they were male. Um, this is about that. Um, I think the interesting thing, and you know, it's not a significant um, increase, but I think if we look at the, the virtual and online meetings um, towards the, the bottom of the plot, we can definitely see a, a sort of increase, if not, as I say, significant increase, but an increase nonetheless in uh, female attendance and registration at, at the online meetings. Um, and I wonder if this feeds into questions around whether or not um, access to meetings when they're online is, is, is better for typically underrepresented groups in the ITF. Um, you know, I, I haven't any, run any statistical tests to see if it's a, a significant result, but you know, just sort of squinting at the graph, um, it looks as if we're seeing an increase. Um, and it's definitely something to, to dig into further, I think. Um, so I had planned to extend this analysis to different subpopulations beyond meeting registrations, so looking at authorship and mailing list participation. Um, I didn't get a chance to do that, um, but that's that's the plan for this sort of thread of work is to to see if um, based on gender, if people um, participate differently in the ITF. So are they more likely to go to meetings, less likely, more likely to communicate in email lists, publish drafts, etc. So that, that's where this is going next. Um, but this is what I've got so far. Okay to ask a question. Uh, so uh, I um, I was wondering if, if you had looked into the, not just the unable to classify, 
case, but also classified errors in the uh, case, because it would seem to me that if you have something that is in the order of some percent, for instance, and, and you're trying to evaluate how many of those are in, in, in the data set, and then if your error rate is in the same order, then, then you might actually get uh, interesting uh, results and, and and you couldn't really trust them too much, but maybe my understanding of, of this is imprecise. Um, so certainly in terms of the, the percentage of registrations that it's not able to classify, that has definitely increased. So at the start of the data set, so say um, ITF 80, it was about 20% of registrations that couldn't map to a, a gender. And by 112, that's about 28%, I think. Um, so it's definitely going up. Again, I don't know what the, the biases are in the, the sort of particular data set behind the library. I think I would need to dig into them a little bit more to see whether that's a significant result. Um, if, if the ITF is becoming more diverse and we're using, I'm using a tool that's, you know, using a, a, a data set that isn't, then, you know, you'd expect the error rate to increase. Um, but again, I would need to, to dig into that to, to see if that's the case. If I can hop in real quick, Stephen. I think I remember that one of the biases in this database, because I have a friend who, who wrote her PhD about um, gender and uh, in GitHub specifically, one of the biases I think she found, but I'll have to double check with her, so don't pin me down on this, is that it's heavily biased towards uh, names that are common in the West. So in that sense, the question that Yari asks in terms of, you know, who can't be classified could actually speak to diversity issues as well that are interesting. So that might definitely be another question that we can um, dig into further. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. I think that they, it, it's quite cool, but it would be interesting to see because I think that it's a little bit of an unfair comparison in the sense that they, every year you tend to have a significant fraction of members that they have repeatedly attended the ITF. So what would be interesting to see is uh, in the share of new members, whether the percentage of uh, female members is increasing or not. Because of course, like this might be every year at 10% or 20% of new members. And if the percentage change there is relatively large, then this is a significant trend, even though the overall number is still relatively small. And it also yeah. would be interesting to see uh, those new uh, female uh, members, uh, for example, are likely to repeat uh, in their attendance more or less than males. Yeah, I think I think that last question is quite interesting. Actually, the sort of behaviour in terms of meetings. You know, how, do they attend one meeting and you are put off by the environment? You know, there's there's questions there that we can dig into. Yep. So I think that was all the slides from my group. Uh, I think there are also some addendum slides that you sent me from Robin, who was also Ooh, in your yes. group, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mirya, yeah. they are also in the uh, GitHub um, uh, GitHub folder for group two addendum slides. This is to me. So I do the hack some work. Yeah, and the two days because this is always have have to stay up very too late in China because this is a time issue. So I have to do some of this the simple analysis. So here this is the data source. So this is you the uh, most active authors and uh, also that's the history of the IB members. So I do some of the interesting work. And uh, so because of the time, so you use this manual spreadsheet. So that's uh, just uh, this uh, simple functionality for the statistics. Okay, next slide. Okay, from this, the most active authors uh, according to the uh, Yaris the web, web, website. So we can see that the the uh, average number of the document of uh, most active authors uh, per area. 
from here we can see that the uh, the uh, number of the document uh, from the RTG area is very high. That is almost the 30 uh, documents for the most uh, active uh, authors. But uh, for others, uh, other area is almost similar. Is just uh, is five between the five and the eight. So this is the interest. Uh, uh, some findings. Next one. Okay, so here we also, uh, because from the China, I have this, the take advantage to do some of these, the statistics about this, the uh, Chinese, the most uh, active authors. So here, from here, we can see that the Chinese, the authors, so in the routine area, there's the most number of the uh, active authors from the China. But uh, it seems that the most of the active authors uh, uh, know, know the active authors for the inter area and the application area. This call also show the uh, interest of the research. And also we see that uh, some of these, the female of the active co-authors from this sample, we can see that the uh, so that we can see this of the, the 20 percentage of this, the Chinese uh, authors. So I think this uh, to some uh, extent is similar from the findings uh, from the, uh, 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 from this, the previous slides. Okay, next one. Okay, so here this is because we have this, the history of the IB members, so the the uh, in the website there's the name and also there this the tenure uh, and this they take this the position of the IB members that is from N2, so that's have this the interest one. So we can see that the most of this the IB members the tenure is uh, two years, four years, or six years, but we also have some of the extreme this the case. And also, this is the 13 years or the 12 years. But uh, most of this happens before the 200. But after that, so this is the tenure. This is uh, always the average. Okay, so that's the my the hackathon work because of time. So that's the, not the complex the course. But uh, later, I think uh, maybe we can have this the more uh, analysis. Okay. That is excellent. So much, so much work done by group two. That is, uh, that is really, that is really, uh, really impressive. It's really excellent work and uh, stuff we can build on. And yeah, that's even more than I expected to be happen in general, actually. But now this is only one part. So now we go over to the work that has been done in group three. Sebastian, would you be so kind to uh, share your slides and present the work done by group three? For sure, Niels. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Great. Um, so we had a number of people that were interested in um, sort of mapping out the way different organizations are involved in IETF and other SDOs. And uh, we started by sort of looking at the, the landscape of data that's available and what data that we'd like to use and and thinking broadly about the links between those data sets that it would be useful to draw. And some of those links are explicit in the data. They're part of the structured data that we get from, say, the data tracker or from other sources. And some, some links have to be built um, or uh, inferred sort of statistically. Um, but based on the kind of, um, you know, they, they say carve the world at its joints. So based on the kind of structure of that of that data, we were able to subdivide into into smaller groups. There was a uh, one group that was looking um, at the kind of metadata that we'd like to see about organizations, say uh, labeling organizations as different kinds of stakeholders, um, 
academic, uh, business, um, sort of uh, internet governance, etc. Um, and um, they they tried to develop a uh, like a taxonomy, and it really became sort of a database schema for of, of what. Uh, a database of this work might might eventually look like, um, and they also did a lot of work by hand, uh, annotating a list of organizations that they got from through GPP. Um, there was also uh, several of us who were looking into um, figuring out how to get a kind of standardized list of organizations um, and draw from other data sets to get that metadata. Um, about say the, the nationality of the organization or these sort of metadata categories. And then um, there was uh, another group of us that uh, was interested in looking at say data tracker records to understand um, a people's affiliation with those organizations over time, how they change uh, and, and using that data to, to, to sort of map between organizations and uh, email domains, um, which often can be done through individual data sets. And then uh, Christoph wound up uh, forming his own group and developed a, a really interesting visualization that sort of built on all of this work together. So um, it, was, it was quite nice because we, we were able to, to really plug our projects into each other and um, sort of deliver something together, which is, uh, yeah, I think, wonderful. Um, so. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the, uh, the spreadsheet that Elizabeth and Niels developed. Um, I believe it started with the 3GPP list of organizations and they added some other organizations and, start, and they were annotating it with uh, business category um, and also these email domains. Um, and that work wound up um, informing, as I mentioned, this kind of, uh, sort of database schema almost or taxonomy of, of what if we had the ideal database of, of this stuff, what would it look like? Um, and uh, and this is work by Nick exploring the wiki data uh, data set, which has some of these categorizations uh, itself. So in the future, we might try to standardize on um, on sector labels from based on some external standard of what those sector labels should be and that would allow us to draw, draw on these external data sets a bit better um, <clears throat> from that i apologize for the you know the pii and the slide you know don't tell anyone but this is all just extracted from um, attendance records from the data tracker and um, i guess what i'm trying to show here is some process um, this, this isn't exactly what's in the data tracker, but with some transformation, we can get these records of uh, individuals with their affiliation, their, uh, their email address uh, with their domain, email domain extracted, and the dates. Um, and, and from that, we can, you know, because we don't actually, for the sake of this analysis, care that much about the individuals, we care about what are the statistical relationships between the affiliated organizations and their uh, domain? So this is showing that, um, you know, out of uh, 128 people uh, or uh, registrations for this uh, span of meetings, which I think is like nine or 10 meetings um, that say they're from uh, Cisco systems, uh, 124 of those registrations uh, use cisco.com. So, uh, that that's a pretty strong signal, um, you know, weakens for for other companies, but um, it's a pretty strong signal that that's the domain associated with the company, uh, which is helpful um, because we can then match that with the uh, kind of hand generated uh, data set that Group A was doing. So uh, I want to point to two things. So um, this is this is a sort of join of the data sets um, on a normalized uh, institution name. So this is using a script that's in Big Bang. It has a kind of um, a, sort of a lexical entity resolution resolver that's tailored specifically to uh, these kind of organization names, um, that getting a match on those normalized uh, entity resolved organization names, uh, allowed joining the data sets. And that's pretty good. I mean, these, um, these domains are uh, are pretty good matches, except as you can see, um, a, like a personal email domain that slips in. So we still have some issues with the uh, the noise, um, 
given the way that the, this particular data is done, but it's, um, it is progress. Um, and then uh, this is work by uh, Christoph Becker. So uh, once the domain names are um, associated with things like company categories, um, it's possible to both both do these very beautiful uh, plots showing that, say, within a particular working group mailing list, uh, you know, it's mostly a conversation between Ericsson and Huawei, um, or Ericsson and Samsung, or, or Huawei and Samsung. Uh, but you can also say so sort of zoom out and say, okay, well, this is between um, you know telecom providers and research institutions, etc. And there's another uh, plot which might be interesting to Wes, which is uh, a similar kind of plot, but with um, uh, sort of country of origin. So um, we're very interested in, in in figuring out how to get the most value out of these data sets as we sort of combine them. Um, we think that this proves the value of combining these data from, from multiple SDOs, uh, as well as external sources, as well as a gold standard hand curated data. Um, and all the data and scripts uh, for so the automated parts of this being added to this Big Bang open source software project. And we really look forward to working more on this in the future, sort of systematically populating this, this notional database to support research, as well as administrative insight into uh, so organizational involvement in these SDFs. That's my last slide. Thanks so much for this excellent overview of uh, uh, work done by a lot of different people, Seb. Um, do people have questions about this or comments or suggestions? I see Corinne's hand is up, or is that an old hand, Corinne? I mean, it's it's an old hand, other than to say that it's um, incredibly cool work. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you specifically, and again, this is a question that I could have asked with any of the sessions, but um, I think it's appropriate here because I both Niels and Nick, who've been working on, um, uh, who've been hacking with you over the last couple of days, have experience doing qualitative research. And one of the things I was wondering is like, how do you see that to be complementary, and if so, at which stage? That's like a huge uh, methodological question. Uh, so uh, if we should. That's talk about what that. I'm here for. <laughs> Well, uh, so so I think that this was very much, if 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 I, if I may, that a lot of this work, and maybe Elisaveta can also comment on this, uh, that there has been quite a lot of uh, hand coding, and so so I think that this work has been based on a lot of mixed methods uh, approach for looking into this data, and that then informed also how uh, uh, how further code should be developed, but I think then verifying it with ethnographic methods and see where it makes sense and where the data doesn't work uh, 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 really helps. So I think it, it really helps to iterate the data and come to better approaches. So I think here, uh, both qualitative and quantitative methods uh, build on each other and inform each other. Yeah, and if I could just follow up on that really quickly, and this is also with the knowledge from um, having sat in your living room as you guys were doing this, I could, Hear you, hear you do the work in the background. One of the things that I was wondering about, especially for the hand coding, um, one is like, did you keep a, a, a log of how you made which decisions? Because obviously, especially when you hand code, you you are the classifier, right? You you are the person that decides that a particular um, bit of data falls within a particular category that the system subsequently runs on, which is a hugely uh impactful decision and people are probably going to push back on it right which means that they can say like well yeah your outcomes might seem interesting but you made decisions that you need to justify so i was wondering how how you've gone about um that sort of thorny issue yeah we took notes but i think christoph might say we did not take enough notes but elisaveta and i did did, did our best to uh, to agree on the note to to, to do that but that, that, but then, um, luckily, Seb and Nick came back and said, like, we should maybe not 
rely on this way and then provide and then scrape wiki data to actually back this up and uh, uh, for instance in affiliation and there there again these things inform each other whether we can then see where wiki data fails or where our thing fails and then the conflicts arise and those are then actually interesting points for research because already like combining the three gpp data sets with ietf data showed us that a lot of um, companies had registrations in different countries which allowed them to uh, have more voting rights in the three gpp and that's why we included subsidiary data so see where the parent company is but how does this then change over time with mergers and acquisitions and that just shows the messiness of the reality and the data and helps us make choices but then we also came to very much the realization to what kind of research question you have will also then choice how you structure the data so there is not one data source that that is authoritative for everything so uh, you're very right so that, that 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 really depends but we try to make notes so that is clear and that would also allow us to restructure the data set to answer different kinds of questions i'd really love it if moving forward we settled on a kind of sort of labor data automation pipeline that um, we could all agree on as being you know as valid as possible and tracking the provenance of the data as we build it and the and all this the mixed methods that we're using like that's a incredibly valuable thing to do um I, my, my current answer is just that i think it, it's going to take work to sort of like you know architect that um but i think we should do that moving forward i'm happy to um yield time to and, uh, else. and I see uh, Ignacio uh, has, a, has his hands up. Yep, I have finally learned how to do it. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments. So I was thinking that they related to um, uh, to the comment from Corinne, and maybe what could be useful is uh, for every affiliation to have, uh, uh, say, like a vector where uh, each number represents one of the potential sources. So you know for every affiliation what has been the source. So in many cases, that will mean that there is a very a uh, good source, so you don't need to worry too much. In other cases, it's more, maybe more heuristical. So in any case, whenever someone spots that heuristic was not very good, you know at least which share of the affiliations are affected by it and therefore how many cases uh, might be uh, impacted. Fantastic, um, yeah. Yeah, and the, the other thing I was wondering is, uh, and I don't know how uh, I, if people feels about it, whether it would make sense going forward to have a more standardized way of collecting uh, affiliation data, because that probably would solve quite a lot of time energy. And I, I guess that this is also relevant for those that they have to file in the patents that might be related to the standards they are pushing and stuff like that. Maybe Robert could say more on this or. Uh... I apologize. I was actually taken away from the meeting for a few moments and I, and I did not hear the last things that were said. Ignacio asked whether there could be a more standardized way to record affiliation data or whether there are plans or there are possibilities or, uh, uh, or where there are obstacles for that. There are not plans to do that. We let people um, place affiliation into drafts with just raw text strings, and um, we also capture uh, an affiliation at registration time that gets into the meeting registration table that are just raw text strings. Um, we have had, had a very simple attempt at normalization of these strings, um, but it's nowhere near as strong as what um, Big Bang already does. Um, the IETF as a whole, I think, would resist the notion of trying to have a standardized set of organizations that people say, yes, I'm from that one, um, because of the tension against the, uh, the, um, the mindset that we are participating as individuals. But... Yeah, I'm, I mean, yeah, I totally understand. Uh, I'm wondering, like, maybe something, uh, something a little bit in the middle where, you know, I register for the ITF and uh, I, let's say I'm from Microsoft, as I'm about to type Microsoft, uh, 
because uh, we already have uh, one record that says Microsoft uh, Microsoft pops up uh, as an uh, uh, sub -compl uh, completion. So if I write it with a typo, that would be avoided. So of course, if I want to write something else uh, or possibly that's totally up to me, but at least it could uh, eliminate a bunch of uh, cases where you just have people writing something slightly different and making it just hard uh, for the person. Yeah, I will uh, forward that suggestion. Thanks so much. So, and if there are uh, no more hands, I only see old hands from Ignacio and uh, Corinne, then I suggest we move to the, uh, to the next group. And the next group uh, I have slide four is group five. And that, and that is presented by Michael. Uh, Michael, would you like to share your own slides or yeah, shall we ask? I can do it. Uh, just give me one minute. Perfect. Take your time. Sorry, I'm here. Um, dum, bum, bum, bum. Let me see. Yes. Okay. Can you see this? Maybe if I go to excellently slideshow, is, is that even better? Probably. Even better. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, ah, and it moves along by itself. I think I'll go to full screen instead of slideshow. It's probably probably nicer. Okay, yeah, so here are the discussions that we, <clears throat> that we, uh, well, the questions that we discussed <clears throat> to kickstart the whole thing. These are text clips from uh, the papers that were submitted. And uh, there were some pretty obvious cases of overlap. Um, you know, this, this side of trying to understand, um, well, uh, the roles of seniors in the IITF or senior participants, people that have been long active and, and, and whether they have had more influence or less influence, does it improve the chance of success or not? So that was something that well, there was a common interest on that. And also as we go further along towards RFC publication, um, well, there was also this, this interest in looking at uh, deeper at the mailing lists and, and understanding uh, working group last calls specifically. So after this discussion, we discussed a few more topics as well, but um, given the number of people who were really there and uh, were interested, we ended up <clears throat> dividing into two groups essentially. We had Priyanka and Amit uh, working on mailing list analysis to identify leaders, influencers, uh, clustering people into groups. Uh, Colin showed us a bit of ongoing work that he has on his side, um, and there seems to be a bit of overlap between already ongoing work on his side and, and what they have started to do. And uh, then it was essentially Carsten and me working on uh, the a bit of an analysis of, of uh, working group last call with technical support from Colin because we used this ITF data library. Um, we were asked to explain what worked and what didn't work. I'll begin with what didn't work. We started out putting everything on uh, Google Colab because that would be a nice platform to collaborate. ITF data works there, but we had at first at least problems getting MongoDB to run. I'm not sure I can uh, represent this correctly because there was me trying it later, but then there was something with the, with the version number. So uh, making this run with MongoDB, I think they managed to do it. and. That was only possible using Python 3.9 and the Python 3.7 version was uh, related to the ITF data version that was, I, I don't know, was ITF data wasn't available at the latest version or something like that. Um, I leave it to my peers to explain that <laughs> in, in greater detail. What did work is the ITF data library. We were having a lot of fun with that. We were, we did have, we should have put this in the past at some point. 
And uh, regarding next steps, well, I mentioned already that um, I'm going to have a PhD student. Finally, this is now settled that really a person is going to be here working on some NLP stuff and working with NLP on this um, on mailing list analysis of the IETF needs to uh, fine tune models because this, the language of these models, they're usually pre-trained on uh, newspaper texts, news texts in general. So they, they need to be adjusted to work uh, with the ITF specific language. And uh, it seems pretty useless for separate groups to do this kind of work independently and not collaborate. So I think we'll definitely stay in touch working on that. But that is future work. So regarding what we've done, here come a few results. And uh, yeah, I think I would like to hand this over to Priyanka now. Uh, Maybe, I don't know, can I share the screen? And <clears throat> speak? Yeah, uh, that, that's great. So like uh, Michael was saying, we did uh, try to have a collaborative notebook as uh, uh, Safikul had suggested so that we could uh, collaborate. And um, the uh, we were able to run MongoDB, which is used by the ITF data library with persistent storage in Google Drive. But we were, I wanted to work with the ITF, the latest library version the default one which uses with the python 3.7 is the 0.4 version um i mean uh, if you'd like to work with that it, it runs fine on google colab um and then i um i found that e email address to person uh, person entity extraction which some of the other people have also found out uh, affiliation person extraction and disambiguation is hard it, because I uh, when I downloaded the v6 ops working group mailing list uh, from the beginning of its inception there were around more than 30,000 emails and um, I ran the script that was example script that was already part of ITF data library uh, to obtain the mailing list uh, addresses uh, from addresses from the email headers and uh, who they pointed to, which person they pointed to. And uh, I was able to get 700 people, participants. But then several email addresses apparently were not resolved to persons like 400 is what I saw reported. And uh, several of them either had no full name or no, not even a list of alternate names, short names or um, things like uh, they are actually organizations, so they don't actually have those full names. Um, so that's something that somebody can probably work on in the future as well. Uh, I was able to mine, uh, 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 earlier groups have tried to see affiliation and gender and other aspects, specific aspects, informed aspects from the domain and then uh, try to understand users and their, uh, and their homophily, like the similarity aspects. Uh, but I, I did it from a temporal activity perspective. And if we move to the next slide, um, we can see that, so I, I did a very rough highlight. This is a hierarchical uh, algorithm. So uh, if you run the algorithm again on these clusters, they will come into more uh, uh, more uh, fine grained clusters, wherein, as you see these peaks, this is a time series. So this is the 60, 65 months that the working groups, uh, this working group has been active. And uh, on the Y axis is the number of uh, emails that uh, that person has sent uh, in that month. So as you can see that um, some people, uh, I mean, those within a cluster, they have uh, overlapping peaks. That is, they were bo all, both or they were all together active during that particular month at, uh, with that volume. And uh, the, they overlap in the peaks, whereas people in different clusters who are in different clusters do not have that overlapping peak with the other cluster. So um, this uh, corresponds also to the topics that they're interested in. So it is that people who are in one cluster, one group, they are more interested in topics that are being discussed uh, within that, uh, like by the people in that group versus people in the other group. 
I was able to find some interesting um, observation that such like ERE and media are both clustered together in one group. I did not use any of their affiliation information uh, or any other demographic information, just their temporal activity. And they come up in the same cluster. Uh, things like, uh, but Michael Richardson or Paul Vixie are in a different cluster. So even within the V6 ops groups, they are in different sub uh, groups, let's say. And Fred is in a completely different cluster altogether. So the, uh, the top level, I had 10 clusters. Obviously, this gets mined finer and finer to find um, uh, whether there are any discrepancy even within the, uh, whether there's any diversity of thought even within the cluster, et cetera. Uh, surprisingly, I was able to also identify, this is something new that I did not know before, that it helped in entity disambiguation. So people with the same name, but different email address were found to be in the same cluster. So even if somebody used a different email address and therefore they had a different person identifier in their tool, they come up as, uh, they tend to come up in the same cluster because their activity, a temporal activity because of their interests, uh, it ends up uh, being similar in with both the email addresses. People like Eric Klein, Lillian Song. So these, as you can see, these are people who are not uh, of the same demography or anything. So this is demography independent. So this is what I could do to begin with. I had a lot of uh, programming challenges, uh, which my partners helped me with, but there's certainly very interesting things and I would like to know still uh, how to be more useful to the IAB and uh, see if these kinds of results are more uh, things. So that's all okay. I have. I think I'll uh, take over and continue. Or I mean, maybe maybe people want if, if somebody wants to ask questions to this part of it, then probably we should even take it now. I guess. Corinne, is that an old hand? Old hand. So feel free to. Uh, okay. Continue, Michael. All right. Well then, um, the working group last call analysis. Um, what we did is we just went through the list of, <clears throat> of RFCs. Um, we got per RFC quite nicely with this library. We, we got the working group last call number. So how, how many last calls there were and also the date of the working group last call that happened in the data tracker. I mean, from the data tracker, um, we did analyze the mailing list discussions related to the first working group last call. So we took the date of the first working group last call and then said, well, uh, look at, let, let's look at the emails that happened before this and after that. Um, and <clears throat> for the set of preceding drafts of an RFC, we, we did that. So, uh, well, we took the emails in this, in, in the range of, of the time from the very first uh, preceding draft that eventually became an RFC until the working group last call date, and then from the working group last call until the RFC publication. And then we filtered these emails by the subject line, which of course, you know, is not 100% like media. We can have a more sophisticated way of tracking a thread, but it gives at least some idea of what it is. Now the drafts changed their name as well, right? So these things might begin with draft reds, stupid idea five, and then at some point it becomes draft IETF, TCPM, stupid idea five. So in that case, uh, stupid idea is the part that I wanted to keep. We may have added draft in the beginning as well, but we were we filtered it that, like that now. This uh, the part that you see in blue in this example down here, and uh, started this, left it running today on uh, the emails that were downloaded. I don't think that even all the emails came complete. Uh, and uh, oh, so yeah, this was all downloaded in alphabetical nature, in alphabetical sequence. So I, I don't, oh yeah, Carsten, you said something? Yeah, just uh, me and we have the full email set that worked. Okay, so you have the full email set, but then uh, it was just a script that was going through it in alphabetical sequence. Uh, so I don't know actually which working group we arrived at in the end. I think we were at letter I somewhere. <laughs> no, no, no. We got through all the names, but the working group we came only to 
something in the C range. In C. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you would have, you know, bit indexed replication and so forth covered in the upcoming statistics. <laughs> Uh, what we show you now is 95 four work working groups, 1,141 RFCs. And uh, these are the quick plots I was able to make from that data. Um, we have the <clears throat> number of participants in these email discussions. That's uh, by using the person ID field from the data tracker. We excluded the authors of the RFCs because these are not so interesting. Um, to understand if the discussion was lively or not, I mean, if people just send emails saying, please read my draft, please read my draft, that's not, that's not so. So, I mean, these are excluded there. Um, and well, you see that the result is kind of expected, right? You have more people discussing before working group last call than after working group last call. Same with the number, the total number of emails that are being sent uh, before and after, obviously, you know, more before and then after is a shorter procedure. The duration as well of after is obviously much shorter. And uh, then the emails per day, uh, they are more in case of after working group last call, which I think is pretty clearly because the, the time of the period after working group last call is much shorter as well. So um, that's that. That's the quick data that I was able to get from this. Um, yeah, that's it. That ends the presentation already. Carsten, do you want to add something? Well, I mean, it would have been really nice to go through our question of how many drafts succeed and if it relates to seniority, but um, even just trying the list to create get the list of all the drafts independent of whether they come from an rfc or not is just a call that is hanging forever so that definitely needs a couple of days to even start running the script so i guess this is what we could do in this short time even though the big question that we had at the start if success and speed are related to seniority would be really interesting to do mm -hmm. But yeah, not doable in two days. Now, indeed, very interesting, but also very great outcomes already. And I think part of the aim of the workshop is also to get interesting questions and path for future research. So in that, you definitely succeeded and uh, enlightened, us all, enlightened us on all on, the, on this uh, group five. So that was excellent. Um, then group six, uh, Safi Cool. Uh, I know you've already presented a lot of the work in the previous session, but is there anything else from the um, hackathon you'd like to present? Or did that already all go in the previous session? Christoph? Um, yeah, for, we don't have more to present than we already mentioned in our first presentation. That's what, that's what I thought, I didn't, but I didn't want to skip over you. Yeah, Thank I you. wanted to say the same thing as well. We we actually produced some bar charts to look at the occurrences and so on, but I think like it contains lots of false positives and it requires a bit of more work. So I don't think like so what the crystal presented is is that that it that's it. Perfect. Perfect. Very good. So um if people have more questions or suggest suggestions on uh, on all this, uh, I actually suggest we start moving into the uh, last session uh, chaired by uh, Mirja and Corinne to uh, um, uh, uh, to help to help us uh, wrap up understand where we are and where we're going from here so uh, over to you uh, Mirja and Corinne yeah, um, I took the opportunity and at the site created a few slides. Um, so let me try if I can share this again. In this case, I might actually just share my screen uh, like this and put this into slideshow mode. Okay. Uh, I hope you can see it. So um, first of all, I put some notes in here based on my own note and my own impression, and I'm sure I'm missing a ton of uh, things because there was so much going on. 
Um, but I think like a big value of this workshop was just connect to everybody to each other and, and to spark some ideas for some new work. And that's also reflected in my slides, I think. So we started the session with talking about data and tools, and this is just like a very um, brief summary. There's like um, all this data people are already using from the mailing list, from the RFC index, from the data tracker. But there were also a couple of things, additional things that we talked about. Um, for example, there are the visitor stats from the web page. There's GitHub that we could probably utilize more. Um, there's data about interrupt testing that could be quite interesting. We have the survey data, um, download statistics for RFC, and so on. So there's probably much more we could add to the um, to the pool. And and we also discussed a lot in, in multiple sessions to um, combine this with data from other STOs to either enrich um, the data set, for example, about affiliations or compare. Um, so we got in, into these tools a little bit. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that people had time to play around with these tools. And uh, we also used the sync up sessions yesterday and the day before to uh, to ask a couple of questions about these tools. So that turns out turned out quite useful. Um, and there were questions about that we just discussed in this question already about how to derive name and gender and how to integrate this into the existing tools uh, and, and make these things um, useful. And this also drove a little bit of discussion, not so much at the main session on Monday, but in the side meetings the last two days about privacy and legitimate use of the data. So this is also something we should look into further. However, I want to um, point out again this slide from um, Robert. So with the data tracker, um, Robert was here and he's like the best contact if you have any questions, problems, uh, proposals for enhancements or whatever. So I think um, uh, I'm, I can freely say that yeah, feel free to contact Robert because he said this multiple times already if you have any questions. Um, and there's also the tools discuss um, mailing list um, if people are looking for mailing list and for other people to discuss these kind of things related to toolings in the ITF. Um, and Robert provided these two links about how the data tracker works. And um, I think he also said that if you if you want to download the data uh, or work on the data tracker itself and you work on enhancements, um, then like he's always happy for contribution. There is a statistics site in data tracker that only shows a very few statistics. So work on that is super welcome. Um, and there's also something that is not in the slides here, which is called the code sprint, which is like a hackathon that is focusing on enhancing the data tracker. And which happens at every meeting as well. So keep that in mind. Okay, so that's the part about tools. Um, then we had these sessions about um, affiliation industry control, um, and we got like already a lot of things from the papers that we, people were interested in about corporate interest versus, versus um, individual contributions. Um, how do companies compete on leadership and these kind of questions? And in the discussion, there were even more more things um, that we were interested to look on. And then people took this up and started to look at this at the hackathon that was about affiliation trends. Uh, the best thing looked into that. Um, we talked about having other sources of fundings, which will also be interesting to get data about. Um, not sure where the data comes from. We talk about um, rather than looking at companies, looking at stakeholder groups and how to characterize companies into stakeholder groups. Some work has been ongoing there. And again, the point about comparing this with other SDOs or enriching our data from with data from other SDOs. Um, community diversity. This session uh, has a little bit more on the slides, and as I said, it's like some of my notes something from the hackathon and so on and there might be things missing because we talked about quite a lot of things so we talked about things like you know who who are we um what is the diversity and how to improve diversity in the ietf uh, and also you know what would the would the ietf be better um if if diversity would be stronger and so we talked about how can you actually measure diversity with the existing tools and we also i like this comment i think from mallory saying like what why are we measuring it right so we measure it because one on the one side we want to have better protocols because diversity should make better protocols but also to make our work more relevant because having more people aware of it and being involved um leads to better outcome that is more relevant for more people so this is um, important and so we also discussed about understanding the organizational structure behind this and started looking at, at mailing lists, like how and like questions like how does behavior and working group or mailing lists drive people away, for example, also open questions. Um, and there was a little point about also interacting with people outside, not only those that come to the ITF. Um, so we had a couple, this was just presented, we had a couple of, of hacking groups that started looking into different things like um, gender, country, uh, distribution and also like talking about this privacy points again. 
And then um, the thing that where we just talked about in the last hacking group basically was uh, more related to process and the um, RFCs itself or decision making um, within the IETF. And then the question is really how do we come to a decision? Um, how do how can we detect when a decision was taken and how can this be used to improve the process? And also, you know, what what is actually makes an RFC successful or what makes um, the product we are producing in the IETF successful? Um, and Michael was looking into last calls. Um, he just presented that, um, but then what, there was also a question about um, tenure, like who's writing successful RFCs? <laughs> what are the characteristics of that? Um, there was analysis of, of mailing list that Priyanka just um, presented. Um, but there's also more questions about how the consensus process works, how we can um, apply natural language processing better to do these kind of analysis. Um, and also then we had a lot of discussion at the meeting on Monday about how to measure deployment, successful deployment, right? And that's what was the point where we were thinking about looking at um, code fragments, code similarity, downloads from libraries, references to RFC, everything that is outreaching. Um, so yeah, I think there's more work here. Ah, right, sorry, one more session that we had today, right? The um, environmental sub sustainability. So here there were like two aspects and some very early results. One is about like, you know, how, what's the impact of our technology? How green is the IETF? Do we consider sustainability enough in developing our protocols? And there was some initial um, uh, analysis, keyword analysis done uh, and there's more work to do, but it's important to create awareness of this topic in the IETF. So this is a good starting point. And then there was also this whole discussion about sustainability of IETF meetings, which is a little bit ongoing in the IETF already in this new working group, but probably more work to be done here as well. So, you know, <laughs> this is like the very quick summary and I'm pretty sure Corinne wants to add a few more words, but like from my side, thank you for all the input you provided in the paper, in the discussion and all the hard work. And it seems like there's more work to be done. So uh, hopefully we can figure out uh, a future venue, uh, probably hackathons at the next ITF meetings, but we could also think about other ways to organize, organize ourselves or um, more workshops or whatever. So maybe this is something a little bit we can discuss right now or any kind of other feedback you want to provide at this point. Yeah, I just want to hop on um, and amplify Mayor's point about thanking all of you who've done the done the hard work and also, um, you know, stress that I I think that if this week has shown anything that we have raised uh, perhaps more new questions than we have answers and I do believe that there is a real community forming around um, ITF data and and what it is useful for but also what it tells us of what we don't yet know. Uh, and also including building new tools. So again, I would love to stress that I hope that this is the start of a conversation and not the end, uh, given the number of questions that we that we have now, and that we can start taking some steps towards organizing a follow up uh, meeting. Because I do believe that it turns out uh, four days is not enough to figure it all out um, and to see what showing the numbers leads to. So I hope that um, that we can do that, and we'll make sure on our end as the organizers to follow up in terms of what you would need and what that would take. And if you have any kind of interest in, in perhaps hosting a next meeting or somehow um, having your organization be involved in that, please do reach out to that. We would very much welcome that. Yes, yeah, so I think we have a little bit more time to actually um, see if people have more input for us, for others, um, feedback about the workshop and um, these kind of things, right? Yeah, to immediately follow up, um on that i think that the uh, uh, for us from the at the university of amsterdam so also speaking for paul groth and uh, and and effie here is that the outcomes of this workshop has been has been amazing a lot of work has been done in the hackathon and well you all know you never know how it goes with a hackathon right will people show up or just check email and people really did not check a lot of email but were very much on the slack and doing a lot of code and presenting really cool outcomes and really, really appreciated also Robert and 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 Yari and I I B also to integrate this, and 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 to really see a connection between academic community, uh, IETF leadership and uh, and industry. So, yeah, we're already at a really good point. So now the way is how to take this momentum further, and we would definitely like to offer another workshop, and hopefully in uh, uh, collaboration with others. And I think Colin also showed some interest, but I'll also look back with the Justice Baron of Northwestern and see if we can, uh, uh, in the course of next year, 
organize another workshop and then hopefully be in person where we can do some in-person hacking. So if you are interested in helping us co-organize that and making that happen, either co-located with an IETF, which then can be stressful, but then also for other people might be there, please do reach out to me and then we'll set up an email thread on that. And then hopefully also, also organized again with the IIB, but then of course also take discussion with the IIB. But I would definitely thank everyone's enormous contributions to this, both in terms of the papers, which we all thought were really good, and then also the excellent work done here and so so just yeah thanks a lot and uh, uh really looking forward to how we can take this work further yeah any feedback comments on the workshop Um, so we will, um, we have the GitHub with uh, hopefully all the slides there, so people can look at what we what we did here, um, find all the information there. Um, and we are, we will also revi write a report for this workshop as we do with all IAB workshops. Um, and at least until the report is finished, we will keep the workshop mailing list open. So if you have any outcome, any findings, anything you want to share, um, please do on the mailing list. I would be very interested to learn more about um, what people are doing. Um, and we can probably also keep that mailing list open if it seems useful after the workshop report is finished. And I see uh, Yari's hand is up, but before that, I'd like to especially thank Kate and Corinne also for taking minute details of the uh, notes of the uh, of the meeting, and Cindy for making it all uh, possible, and that will really help us in the report writing and further follow up. So. We also know how, how troublesome logistics can be. So thanks so much for that. And uh, Yari, please come in. Yeah, I also wanted to uh, thank the organizers and everybody who pitched in. Uh, amazing amount of work, uh, so much achieved even even uh, this week uh, by other people. But um, uh, I wanted to say a few things, uh, additional observations. So, so obviously one thing here is not just the achievements but sort of getting to know each other and and then maybe this is a start for collaboration in that sense uh, and also when it comes to the tooling um, at least for me a, a sort of a takeaway is that uh, we don't actually live in this monolithic uh, tool world anymore that there's many components uh, itf data is one example of that but not the only one it's also like uh, this gender analysis and other 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 useful things and so maybe that's also another start that we can we can uh, collaborate more in that sense that, that we have useful pieces that can be uh, used and in, uh, in in several different uh, contexts and uh, and indeed many um, many new questions opened also I, I was kind of inspired by this session on sustainability as well but, but of course it's not just the sustainability issues for the ITF organization it's also about our technology i was kind of like thinking about could we compare some of the potential things we could do uh or not enough compare but but sort of quantify what what are the impacts of various kinds of practices that, that we run in the internet today and how much savings could we get through those so i, I think that's also interesting direction maybe for somebody to consider Any further comment? What did you like? What did you not like about the workshop? Yeah, I one comment I, I'd like to make is um, it was very nice to to, to see um, some of the tools that have been developed. And um, if I have known them earlier, I probably um, I mean, it probably have uh, helped me to do some uh, passing of HTML pages and so on. So. I think it's important that we know uh, those tools exist so people can build on the specific um, question they asked and, and they don't redo ev everything um, from scratch. So, yes, I also just wanted to thank um, the organizers for this uh, incredible workshop. As uh, Danny just said, I mean, also. I stumbled upon, upon uh, other people's work that really helped also Big Bang a lot. 
uh, to progress. Um, and yeah, for all the nice feedback I, I, I got for the, the work that uh, Safik and I are doing now, um, I think we, we will put some more effort in there and, and see where we get and, and maybe can present some um, results uh, next year in person, maybe, hopefully. Let's see. Thank you. So the, um, the, because this is all about the ATF and there are a couple more ITF meetings <laughs> coming up, right? So um, if you if you keep us uh, up to date with the data you have, there might also be chances to present this data at the ITF meetings in various groups. Yeah, of course. Um, there is a hand from Robin. Uh, thanks also very much for the chance to <clears throat> take the uh, possible work in the in the workshop. Yeah, because in fact that uh, before this workshop, in fact uh, my most of my work in the IETF is about this the technical and the network engineering. But uh, in fact, in the process of the take the position of the IB and of this the. Uh, and also in the process of the aid workshop that is aware more about this internet is related much with the society uh, and the politics and also the ethic etc and also the ITF is a very important community uh, but you know that the ITF is also is a volunteer <coughs> uh, community so that, uh, in fact, we also want to improve our reach out. But uh, as the, we know that uh, if we want to improve our work, we need the measurement. And also this is the, uh, and according to the measurement, we can take the, uh, take this the possible actions. So I think this is very important, but uh, because of the ITF, the volunteer work, so that we, <coughs> we uh, in the history, we, Cannot get the enough this the measurement, but I think this is the workshop that is a very a very good chance to that is to uh, exchange this the uh, information that between the IETF and the academia, and also that is very appreciate this academia work to do the research on the IETF data. So I think and also that's your work is very important, and also that's your this the. Analysis will be very helpful to improve the IETI work. So I want to uh, last uh, say very thanks for your uh, all the, this possible work and also uh, hope that this work can be sustained. Thanks, thanks very much. Yes. I just want to thank everybody for for actually being willing to try this virtually. Um, you know, this was an experiment, and it actually showed that it worked. We actually did things, you know, somewhat together. I'm sure it wasn't quite as nice as in person, but you know, if we want to both increase productivity and simultaneously decrease our travel for either you know environmental reasons or personal health reasons, um, we have to keep trying things like this in order to figure out what works and what doesn't and you know it's just not going to magically fix itself without us uh, trying things i found you know gather was it was interesting you know it actually worked as sort of a of a, of a hacking space so it was kind of neat to do and and though i did get distracted by my day job more than i might have if i was in person i still got stuff done right i still made it work and um, uh, hopefully we can continue collaboration like this in other venues because i may not have come to amsterdam if it was in amsterdam um, have been, well, okay, I would have now because I haven't traveled in a year and a half, but on a normal year, I may not have come. Right? So. Nick? Well, I, I, I also want to um, thank people for participating and, and thank our organizers for getting these different groups together. I think that um, really has a long-term value. I think in terms of the format, I really enjoyed having both some sort of workshop presentation style and some time for for hackathon uh, check in. And maybe the only thing that seems uh, a, a little bit lacking to me is that well, maybe if we'd had a full week, maybe with one more day of hacking, I could have gotten a little bit more done. Um, and and really, that just makes me think this is a really natural fit this community and this style is a very natural fit for the 
for the uh, week-long hackathon before an IETF meeting. And so um, ho hopefully that can be a regular thing. But I don't know if at every IETF hackathon, but but um, maybe at some of them we can organize that, oh, okay, we should get the, the IETF data people together um, because a, a week of hacking with occasional check-ins um, can potentially be... I, I, I think really impactful for, for the long term work, in, including, you know, sure, many of us know about other work that's going on now, or, or maybe we had some of these connections already, but um, all of us working on new code and new spreadsheets and data sets together um, for a week could could make a big difference. So I'm, I'm eager to see how we continue it, but I think the, the hackathon is a good option. Yeah, which uh, which reminds me of one more point. So um, I, I think we have made some really good connections here and, and got a really nice group of people. But I think one thing we should do is try to do some more outreach. I'm sure there are more people who are working or start working in this space. So we should definitely try how to um, connect there. Maybe for the for the hackathon or for any kind of other event we might be organizing in future. Their queue management. Um, you can. Ah, I didn't see your hand because the picture is. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. The video is, so, is there. Okay. Yeah, you know, I do think that um, the efforts that people have started here don't don't stop pushing on them just because we got to the end of this particular event. Um, keep the inertia up, and the outreach that this instance of this workshop um, achieved is is very impressive um, and I, I'm glad that we uh, attracted the the group of people that we have and that we've gotten to know each other um, for those of us that met this for the first time at this event I think it's worth repeating um, periodically every you know, every year or every two years some find the right cadence but new problems are going to come along, and I think this particular format um, and and it being something that is um, scoped the way the this particular workshop was scoped will um, uh, be a strong attractor for um, the the kinds of of uh, contributors that we would like to see coming in and helping us un understand. The, the data that we've got and the data that we need to um, start looking at how to collect. So I believe that's the end of, oh no, there's one more hand. Ignacio. Yeah, no, well, just to join everybody else in the green, but uh, it was great. Thank you, organizer. Thank you for the, for everybody who participated. And uh, looking forward to the next workshop. And uh, maybe we could take uh, the next workshop as an opportunity to try to see how to organize this as a more regular thing that goes forward in time. I think it's a great thing to do. Thank you. That's very good input that people are interested in having this on a more regular basis and uh, find some kind of way to meet up. So. We we'll definitely think about the right form for this. Anybody else? Corinne, any anything else you want to add? I mean, other than uh, the fact that I'm really happy to see that everyone else is as enthusiastic about um, doing more of these as I am. You no, know, um, just you know, thank you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I look forward to picking up on uh, figuring out how we can do this again. Definitely. Then that's thank you from my side as well. And have a nice evening, rest of your day, rest of your night, whatever. Yeah. And as a final note, thanks everyone for also making this really a constructive thing where everyone got to speak and everyone got to contribute. So I really felt that there was a really good contribution from everyone and there was space for that. So. Thanks so much for making that happen and have a great weekend and see you on the next one. See you on the list. Happy hacking. Yeah.
Bye. The only thing we're missing uh, now is the conference dinner, right? But <laughs> 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 next time. Next bye. time. Bye. 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 Bye.